Happy New Year, everybody. Good morning. You all made it in without frostbiting your extremities, I hope. Yes. All right. And Happy New Year, all of you who are worshiping with us from the comfort of your homes. We are going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper today. Those of you at home are going to need to provide your own elements, a little bit of bread or a cracker, and either some juice, some wine, or some water. Those of you who are here in person, you're sort of going to need to provide your own elements. You need to pick up one of the little cups and the little wafers. One of the things we learned on Christmas Eve is there is a little bit of leakage with these. So take a look at your wafer and shake it around oh, just a little bit and make sure that it's still nice, dry, and not at all purple. <laughs> and if, if it does have a little bit of juice on it, just throw that away and pick up one that, where they're completely separate. All right. Are there any announcements? I feel like I'm not on. Is this on? Okay. All right. Any announcements that didn't make it into the bulletin or any announcements that you guys would like to emphasize? I'd like you to bring your attention to three things. Um, adult Christian education. We've got three things coming up. Into the Light, which is the Presbyterian Women's Horizons Bible Study for this year. Uh, finding Hope through prayers of lament. It's not as depressing as it sounds. It's, it brings into the conversation and into the spiritual life the practice of lament, which we tend to downplay or overlook or ignore in our culture, but which is actually incredibly healthy psychologically and spiritually. So the ladies will be working on that on Tuesday mornings. Um, it, starting in February. Okay, in that case, what the bulletin says about this Tuesday, forget that. It'll start in February. We're not meeting at all this week? Okay. Uh, starting on the 23rd, the Sunday morning discussion group is going to be starting to talk about Jesus is the question, the 307 questions Jesus asked, and the three he answered. There are copies available in the office, and you can talk to Kathy about getting one of those. And next Sunday, the 16th, no, the next Sunday, the 9th, and then the Sunday after that, the 16th, we're going to have just a two-Sunday class called Bible 101. If you find the Bible baffling or if you feel like you need a Bible brush up, this will be a fun class that will dig into the Bible itself. So you're all welcome. Any other questions or comments? or announcements. Yes. All of this gets to come down because by the time we meet again, the Christmas season will be over, although next Sunday we are celebrating the Feast of the Epiphany with the wise ones. There may or may not have been three of them. They may or may not have been men. We're going to celebrate with them all the same. <laughs> all right. So. If you can, stay for the whole thing or stay for just a part of it. We're going to be taking down the greens after worship today. Many hands make light work. It would be great to have at least a little bit of everybody's help. And we are not going to be taking the outside decorations down today for hopefully obvious reasons. All right. All right, friends. Get comfortable where you're seated. Take a breath or two and prepare to worship God as we listen to the prelude.
Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. All things have been created through him and for him. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is where all things begin, so he might come to have sovereignty over all things. In Jesus, all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell, and through Jesus, God is pleased to reconcile all things to God, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. Will the kids come up, please? Hi, you guys. Hi, Aubrey. You coming up, Cora? Okay. All right. So today is a special day in the church year. It's called the Holy Name of Jesus Day. What does that mean? What does that mean indeed? I am so glad you asked, Cora. We're going to begin with One hundred thousand baby names, and just so you guys know that this is quality, it is the most helpful, complete, and up-to-date name book. It says so on the cover, so we can trust that. So, your names mean something. Did you know that? It does mean leader elf. Aubrey's name is from French, and it means the elf ruler or the elf leader, but it also comes from German, and it can mean noble or bear-like. Oh, no. What does my name mean? What does Cora's name mean? Let's find out. It is from Greek, the Greek language, and it means maiden, but from mythology, it is also another name for Persephone, who was the goddess of the underworld. Ooh, Miles. <laughs> Miles, would you like to know what your name means? All right. The question is, what does Miles' name not mean? Miles, your name in Greek means millstone. That's a great big stone that was used to, that was used to grind grain. In Latin, it means soldier. In German, it means merciful. <laughs> this is so exciting, isn't it? And in English, it's a shortened form of Michael, and the name Michael means who is like God. What's Rowan's name? Who is, Rowan's okay. Name means little redhead. It means little redhead. <laughs> we don't know how he got that name. It's so weird. Daddy. All right. Okay, so 
I made a little slideshow to show you guys, and the grown-ups are going to get to see too. Right up there. The name on the left that looks like it's in funny letters, that's Greek, and Korah came from Greek, remember? That is what Jesus' name looks like in Greek. And it's pronounced Jesus, but we pronounce it Jesus in English. Okay, so here's the interesting thing about Jesus' name. Jesus' name is a Greek translation of a name that you guys know from the Hebrew. And we'll go to the next. There we go. Jesus in Greek means the same thing as Joshua. Joshua. How many of you guys know a Joshua? Joshua was a giraffe. Joshua was a giraffe. There you go. Okay. Well, if that Joshua was a giraffe in Greece, his name would be Jesus. How crazy is that? Okay, but here's, here's something that's really cool. So the Bible tells us that an angel came to Joseph and said, your wife Mary is going to have a baby and you are going to name him Jesus because he is going to save the people from all their sins. Well, why name somebody Jesus if they're going to save people from their sins? Well, because his name in Hebrew is Joshua, and that means God saves. So, when we talk about the holy name of Jesus, we're not just talking about Jesus being God and being holy. We're talking about what his name means. And his name is God's promise to us that God will always, always be with us. God will always, always protect us. And with God, we are always going to be cared for. Even in, even in the darkest moment, God will still be with us. Okay. I want you to say that really loud. Or do you want me to repeat it really loud? Cora said, even in the darkest moment, God will be with us. God will be with us. Very good. Very good. Well, let's pray. This is the first Sunday of the new year. So what should we pray for for the new year? What do you think? Pray that you get to go to the Omaha Zoo. Pray for, pray that God is with us. Okay. All right. Well, let's let the Spirit lead. Dear God, thank you for being with us. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you for protecting animals and all of creation. We ask that you protect your people and continue to remind us that you are with us. Above all, thank you, thank you, thank you for loving us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Good job, goddess of the underworld. Our prayer of confession is not merely a review of our wrongdoing. It is an affirmation of faith in the God whose love surpasses our sin. We are not convicted criminals before an impartial judge, but cherished children of a beloved parent. Trusting in that love, let us offer our confession to God. Let us pray. God of glory, your splendor shines from a trough in a small town where the light of the world is born into the darkness of human night. We confess that we take this story for granted and rarely give it the consideration it deserves. Therefore, we look for glory in the high places of human power, fame, and wealth. We cheer for those who lord it over others. We believe those with the biggest audiences we celebrate beauty and success. None of that mattered at your birth or during your earthly life. Forgive us, beloved God. Redirect our eyes to where Christ chose to dwell, in the shadowy and sorrowful places of our world. May you bear the touch of the world in times and places of your choosing.
Amen. Friends, the incarnation of God gathers us into the covenant that God made with Israel. We are a chosen people, freely forgiven and entirely beloved. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Glory to God in the highest. Friends, will you pray with me? Glorious God, here we are at the turning of another year. And we give thanks that we have made it through another very, very strange, very, very challenging, and in some ways very scary year. We have come through a lot, and we have seen a lot more that's going on with people around the country and around the world. Help us to count ourselves blessed when things are going well and when things are not going well, gracious God. Help us to count ourselves blessed that you are with us in all things. We lift up prayers today for those who are cold in this severe, severe weather for those in Kentucky and other states who are still picking up the pieces after the windstorm of a few weeks ago. And we pray, O oh God, for those in Boulder, Colorado, who are picking up the pieces after the fires of this last week. Gracious God, when we see things like this, we pray that you will keep our hearts soft and open. Grow our compassion in us, our Christ-like love, so that we can pray without despair, and so that we can reach out with energy and imagination and love. Gracious God, here at the beginning of the year, we offer ourselves to you. Through the words of John Wesley's covenant prayer. And we pray this, O oh God, on behalf of our entire fellowship here at First Presbyterian Church, knowing that we enter into a year of deliberate transition. We offer you this prayer in our very hearts and souls. We are no longer our own, but yours. Put us to what you will. Place us with whom you will. Put us to doing. Put us to suffering. Let us be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let us be full. Let us be empty. Let us have all things, let us have nothing. We freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, a wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are ours and we are yours. So be it. And the covenant which we have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven in your holy, holy name. Amen.
Let us pray. O God of ancient blessing, your servant Mary pondered in her heart the treasured word spoken about her son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Prepare our hearts to receive his spirit, so our tongues may confess him, Lord. Amen. This morning's first lesson comes from the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. Moses is giving the priests instructions for identifying God's people in a unique way by God's lordly title, El, and by their relationship with God, Israel, which means to struggle. This is Numbers, chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. Listen for God's word. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his children to bless the people of Israel with this special blessing. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look favorably upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. The word of the Lord. Our second lesson takes us back to the beginning of the Christmas story in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph Son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from all their sins. All this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the Lord woman, the young woman will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. The word of the Lord. Eighteen years ago, uh, two economists from the University of Chicago by the name of Marian Bertrand and Send Heal Melanathan conducted an experiment where they sent several thousand nearly identical resumes to companies hiring entry-level workers. The one thing they changed on the resumes was the name of the applicant. Bertrand and Melanathan published their findings in an article uh, in the American Economic Review in 2004. And that, t- that article was entitled, Are Emily and Greg More Employable Than Lakeisha and Jamal? A Field Experiment on Labor Market Discrimination. The answer, it turns out, is yes. The resumes with white sounding names were 50% more likely to receive callbacks than resumes with black-sounding names. This experiment has been repeated dozens of times all over the United States by lots of different universities and agencies, and while the percentage of callbacks goes up and down some, the result is always the same, a statistically significant gap between resumes with black-sounding names and resumes with white-sounding names. Before I continue, I would just like to say that the take-home message here is not that you should name your daughter Jackie, not Janiqua, and your son Sean, not Deshaun. Not the take-home message. But it does beg the question, what is in a name? Shakespeare famously quipped, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. That may hold for plants. If it's 100 degrees outside, and I have to mow, I'm not going to be any happier mowing poesia than I am mowing grass. But it doesn't hold for people, 
and the, res the resume experiment proves this. Names matter. They carry a tremendous amount of meaning and weight. They identify us. I sometimes joke that my first name is spelled with a C, but I'll answer to Erica with a K. Except if you leave a misspelled note and there's an Erica with a K somewhere in the vicinity, I'm going to assume the note is for her because my name is E-R-I-C-A, not E-R-I-K-A. There's a scene in an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation where the new doctor is getting to know the crew and she calls the android data, data. And he doesn't realize that she's talking to him. And so when he realizes it, he corrects her. He corrects her pronunciation. And she says, data, data, what's the difference? And data says, one is my name, the other isn't. The Social Security Administration has a great website, don't go there now, of the 400 most popular baby names in each decade since the 1880s. If your name is Sharon, Carol, Larry, or Richard, there is a good chance you were born in the 1940s or 1950s. If your name is Amy, Melissa, Jason, or Brian, good chance you were born in the 1970s or the 1980s. If your name is Sophia, Ava, Liam, or Mason, you're probably in grade school, if not diapers. How many of you were named for family members? Yeah, we've got several of you. Yeah, names locate us in our families. Sometimes names reveal where we're from. Common names in India are very different from common names in Mexico, which are very different from common names in the United States. And even within countries, a boy named Bo, spelled B-O, that kid is probably from Texas. If it's spelled B-E-A-U, Bo, that kid's probably from Louisiana. If your name is Sunshine and the dot over the I on your birth certificate is a star, you are definitely from California. <laughs> Names are a big deal, even more so in the ancient world. People believed that names had special powers. We see this in that story of Jesus' encounter with the demon Legion. It's the only demon that Jesus asks the name of, and Legion tells him, and then immediately begs Jesus not to send him into the abyss, because now that Jesus has Legion's name, Legion knows that Jesus can do whatever he wants with him. That's what ancient people believed, that names had power, and you could, you could relinquish that power to the wrong people. And there are people to this day who believe that the name of our God has so much power for a mortal to speak the name of God is equivalent to cursing the name of God. So let's take a look at this. This word right here is the tetragrammaton. It is the unspeakable name of God in conservative Orthodox Judaism. We translate it Yahweh. YWHW retains that four letter sort of sacred look. In English, we translate it Yahweh. The word is so holy that many, many Jewish people will not speak it. They will not say Yahweh. When they're reading the Bible aloud, which they do in their regular worship, and they see this word in print, they will not say it. We can advance it two more. So they see that in print, do not go there. What they do instead is that they say this word, Adonai which means Lord. So we've got this sacred, powerful name, a dangerous name, dangerous for mere mortals to utter. But then the word becomes flesh. 
and is born among us, and as we all do, God needs a name, a new name now. Obviously, it would have put Mary in a very awkward position if she'd had to ball Jesus out for breaking a window, playing stickball, if she'd had to use the unspeakable name. I mean, how does the kid even know he's in trouble? I asked my mom once why Jesus had two names, Jesus and Emmanuel. She said maybe one of them was his middle name. And that makes the stickball situation make more sense because you know you're in serious trouble when your mom trots out your middle name. Jesus Emmanuel, you get in here right now and clean up this mess. And this is ringing true. Okay, all joking aside, Emmanuel, as used in the Gospel of Matthew, isn't a name, it's a title. God with us or God is with us. It comes from an observation from the prophet Isaiah, and the prophet Isaiah worked about 800 years before Christ. And Isaiah was talking about a very specific political situation in the southern kingdom of Judah. And what he was trying to do was reassure the king that God was still with the southern kingdom, even though the northern kingdom was about to fall. And the young woman about whom Isaiah speaks, the child that he talks about being born, scholars aren't quite sure who exactly he was talking about in that time, but it was probably the king's child, or maybe it was even Isaiah's child. And we will name him Emmanuel because God is with us. Christians have looked to that little prophecy and that name and given it a different interpretation. And the author of Matthew's gospel was the first to do this. He took this prophecy from in Israel's ancient history at that time and applied it to his own time when things politically and probably economically were definitely not going very well. Matthew probably wrote his gospel not long after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the second temple. The second temple was the one that got built after the first one got burned down by the Babylonians 600 years earlier. The great apostles Paul and Peter by this time were both dead, executed by the state. Christ followers, not many of them, but enough, were refusing to worship Caesar and many of them were being imprisoned, tortured, and executed. And into this, Matthew writes, a child is born and God is with us still. Not philosophically, not spiritually, but physically, here, now. We can point to Emmanuel. We can touch Emmanuel, there's his mother yelling at him about the window. It doesn't get any more real than this. God is with us. But Matthew goes further. And he, he kind of takes a different angle on the command that Luke says the angel gave Mary to name Jesus, Jesus. Matthew says that that message goes to Joseph. You shall name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, which is Joshua, which means God saves. There's kind of an interesting connection here between Joseph's name and Jesus' name and two of the great heroes of the Hebrew Bible. Joseph was the, I think, great-great-grandson of Abraham. Abraham had been given the promise of God, I am in covenant with you, your descendants will inherit this land and they will be as numerous as the stars in the sky, but first, they're gonna be slaves in a foreign land for 400 years. Joseph is the guy who gets them to Egypt. And eventually they are enslaved. Joshua is the guy who leads the Israelites through the Exodus and into the promised land. So let's review that a little bit. If Moses is the hero of the actual Exodus, Joshua is the hero of the 40 years in the desert and then their 
conquest of the promised land. He is one of only two Israelites born in Egypt, in slavery, whom God permits to enter the promised land. God doesn't even let Moses go into the promised land. But Joshua gets to go in, and so does Caleb. This guy, Joshua, was the leader who witnessed the plagues of Egypt, witnessed the angel of death bypassing the houses of the slaves, witnessed the parting of the Red Sea and the drowning of Pharaoh's army, ate manna and quail and drank water from the rock in the desert, led the spies into the promised land and discovered a land flowing with milk and honey, survived 40 years of wandering around in the desert, led God's people through the parted waters of the Jordan, led Israel's campaign to settle in the promised land, and then famously left them with the words, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God saves Joshua. It is no mistake that Matthew reminds us of the meaning of this name and the connection to this ancient deliverer of Israel in this story of the naming of Jesus. God saved Israel back then. God will save again with one important difference. God, through Joshua, delivered God's people from slavery and 40 years of wandering around in the desert and delivered them to their ancestral home. Jesus, Matthew says, will deliver God's people from their sins. There's something much, much, much bigger going on with Jesus than was going on with Joshua, despite the fact that they have the same name. What's in a name? When we pray, when we contemplate scenes from his life like this, how deeply do we let the meaning of this name, God saves, God with us, get into us? Does a savior, by any other name, smell as sweet? So let's consider these names. Jesus, God saves. Emmanuel, God with us. We are saying this is the God who undertook human flesh in the commonest possible way. If this were to happen the same way today, he'd be born in someone's garage to a teenage mom with no insurance. This God worked hard with his hands, probably outside in the elements a lot of the time. If this were to happen the same way today, he would be a regular guy working long hours with calluses on his hands and maybe a bar where everybody knew his name. This was a God who hung out with enough irregular people to make the best people very suspicious about his motives and his morality. If this were to happen the same way today, he would not be warmly received in most of our churches. Jesus didn't get grossed out by people who were really sick or even physically deformed. He touched them. He prayed over them. He blessed them. He ate lunch with them. He held their kids on his lap. If this were to happen the same way today, people would say he was a saint or crazy or maybe both. This God spoke the truth, even to people with the power to shut him down, and they did. He suffered no foolishness, even from his best friend. Peter got more than one earful from Jesus. If this were to happen the same way today, we wouldn't know what to do with someone so direct in telling the truth. We are far more comfortable lobbing semi-factual grenades from the relative safety of social media. This God knew that the things that he said and did would enrage people who loved the status quo and didn't care who it hurt. In fact, who blamed the poor and outcast for their poverty and alienation. If this were to happen the same way today, I suggest he'd be publishing and defending research like that resume experiment. What a remarkable God with us. What a remarkable God who saves. So the passage we heard from Numbers earlier is this old, 
old, old blessing spoken over the people of Israel, capturing that notion of God, El, that lordly Hebrew title. We are called by God's name as well, quite literally. Our name as a people says we belong to this God, that this God is in eternal covenant with us, this God blesses and protects us, this God enjoys us and forgives us, and this God sees and makes peace with us. This is what it means, my friends, when we say that God is Jesus Christ and we bear his name, my fellow Christians. Amen. Will you rise for the next hymn, please? Please be seated. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the Lord our God. Scripture tells us they will come from everywhere, east, west, north, south, that this table is set for people of all the nations. Anyone who hungers and thirsts for the righteousness of God is welcome at this table. Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let's pray. Holy Creator, God of the universe, with joy we praise you and give you thanks. You drew boundaries around light and darkness. With just a word, you raised the land up from the sea. You made your image to live you made us in your image to live with one another in love. You promised yourself in covenant with us. You shared your purpose with us in your law. And you called for justice through the prophets. Through all the long generations, you have been with us. You have saved your people. And we praise you, most holy God, for the gift of yourself in Christ Jesus. We affirm together now what it is we believe through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, 
and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Loving God, remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we break bread and share one cup, giving thanks for the saving love of God in Jesus Christ and offering ourselves to live for you joyfully and gratefully. Holy Spirit, pour yourself out upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup as the fruit of the vine and wheat of the field nourish our bodies, may this sacred meal nourish the body of Christ, his church in the world. Make us one with Christ and one another. Send us out to live for others as Christ lived for us. And keep us faithful until we feast again with him in glory. Amen. On the night when Jesus was arrested by the religious authorities and betrayed by his friends, he shared the Passover meal with his disciples. During that meal, Jesus took bread. He thanked God for it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, Jesus took the cup, Thanking God, he poured it out and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. We will begin with the wafer. The body of Christ, broken for you. cup of salvation poured out for you. Thanks be to God.
Friends, let's close this celebration of the sacrament with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we're going to end with Go Tell It on the Mountain. We're going to sing the refrain twice, the third verse once through, and then the refrain three times through. We've got instructions up on the screen if you need them. That's your charge. Go forth and tell it on the mountain, or on the street corner, or at the coffee shop, or online. And may God, our glorious God, bless you and keep you. May Jesus Christ's face shine upon you people who are called by his name, and may the Holy Spirit give us all and the world peace this year and always. Yay. Amen. Amen.